Tell them what time it is. Little hen says it's time to rock and roll. All you people are so scared of me. Come quietly or there will be trouble. Man, that's just me. I'm Batman. This is Sparta! There is a tiger in the bathroom. I'm an excellent driver. If it bleeds, we can kill it. Pop quiz, hot shot. Keep the change, you filthy animal. It's alive. Oh, it's alive. It's alive. It's alive. It's alive. Oh, in the name of God. Now I know what it feels like to be God. Hello and welcome to this week's Monday Movie Show for our first show in December, the Monday the 7th of December. Ridiculous, isn't it? Already? Um, no, it wasn't first show. Well, well yes, it was last week, December. yes. Okay. Your first show in December. Yeah, my first show in December. Yes. Yeah, although it's the 7th, so it's only sort of the first week in December still. Fingers yeah, crossed, yeah. The thing is that it's definitely not your last <laughs> show in December because I think we've got... Four shows before the end of the year to do. Yeah, a lot of things to do. As we've got a lot of things coming up in this show, because um, coming up in cinema section. Although there are a lot more releases this week, we didn't get to see everything. But covering this week in cinema's releases, we have these films. Yeah, one film which I'm sort of glad we didn't get to see, which was Christmas with the Coopers. From what I'm hearing about that movie, it's one of those um, New Year's Day kind of films where it has multiple different actors in it with multiple different storylines in it, and none of them tie together very well. So we're skipping that this week, and so instead we're looking at um, Victor Frankenstein starring Daniel Radcliffe. We've got the comedy The Night Before starring Seth uh, Rogen. I would need to say Seth MacFarlane there. And then... Oh, oh, yeah. Um, as well as usual, some movie news, the UK box office top 10, and then DVDs and Blu-rays in the home release section will be covering these films. Yes, some huge releases this week in the form of Mission Impossible, Walk Nation, The Gift, The Man From Uncle, or if you want to be pedantic, u.n.c.l.e, um, Train Wreck, comedy, sort of, <laughs> Yeah. We are scraping the barrel with absolutely anything. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely anything and a few others, I think. We'll get to them, though. I mean, everything's getting released in time for Christmas, of course. So all the big releases are now coming to home release uh, for that. But before that, was, of course, although we're going to the UK Books Office and everything in a minute. Um, but it's worth mentioning as well, we have got specials upcoming. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be doing a Star Wars special. I don't think we've sorted out the date yet, have we? Star Wars is out 17th of December, isn't it? Yeah, but, but it's so with us. I mean, we will be doing it some point shortly thereafter. Well, what we'll try to do is because we're going to get our end of the year, our end of the year show is going to be slightly later this year. So we'll probably do that on the Tuesday of Christmas week, and we'll try to get the Star Wars special out on the Sunday night, even though. I might be banging my head against a wall there because the fact that I've got another end of year show to do. So it, I might, it might be end for me end of year show, then Star Wars special on the Monday, then our end of year show on the Tuesday. Yeah, you might be banging my head against the wall a bit there too. <laughs> yeah, but three shows in one for me, where I've got to get a ton of work together. Uh, mm. uh, yeah, and uh, I work in retail as well, so that's joyful for me. Yeah, but also one of those shows will be our sort of end of the year awards section where we'll go through our pick of the year selection, which I've still got to sort mine out, but you've got a bunch of yours sorted out already. Any I've highlights? Got my, I've got my top 10 worst list. I've got my top 10 best list. A couple of surprises in my best list. Um, I've also got my, my special awards, which I normally have. Um, best animated feature. Um, biggest... And now I've, I've actually split it in two. Um, biggest surprise, and because there are some films this year that was biggest dis- disappointment, I'm actually su- sneaking in three awards. Three, so, okay. Yeah, so a biggest surprise and biggest disappointment. I've got them all sorted out. Everything sorted out on that front. I just need to work out my best film, best actor, best actress, best director, supporting actor, supporting actress. Yeah, I got a lot to do actually. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done any, I haven't I haven't got mine all sorted. I've got I've got a list of about thirty films to whittle down for my top ten. <laughs> well I had about thirty films to whittle down for my worst ten. Um but yeah and then we've gotta have the argument together to try and come up with our combined top ten and our worst ten list of the year. That's always fun. Yeah, 
That's always fun, usually. Um, as ever, if you're listening to us live, you can join us in the bottom right hand corner. There's a little speech window there. Um, you just click on that and type away, and we will see it. Uh, whether or not we'll answer to it, I don't know, but we'll definitely see it. Um, but um, we'll get going. If you've got any comments on any of the films as we're going through, obviously shout us out, let us know, and we'll see if we can incorporate them into as we're going along. Uh, but starting off with some movie news, I'm going to go first off with a bit of sad news regarding the actor Robert Logier, um, who passed away at the age of 85 last week. Um, he'd been known uh, to be suffering from Alzheimer's um, and may not be recognisable to a lot of people. I mean, he's, his name originally born uh, Salvatore Logier in 1930. Um, had a, a career that spanned over 200 roles. Uh, including roles in films such as Scarface and in particular the one that maybe people will recognise him more recently and would have been as the general in Independence Day. Um, he's a very, very well known, he's got a very, he had a very gruff voice, very, he played angry very well for me. In a lot of films he was in, he started then playing angry characters and played them with so much, not just, you know, it wasn't just an angry person all the time, but he had great anger in his roles, which is what kind of made him memorable, I think. It, it's always sad news to hear um, to hear the death of any actor, whether people actually know them or not. And surprisingly, the, when you hear the name of an actor who you're not sure about, as soon as you hear the roles that they, they were involved in, that's when you start clicking, oh, him, and yeah. oh, him. So it, 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 is, it is sad. And you might not have known him, but like I said, you'll have seen him in something. I think he was in things like Big as well. He was in, you know, yeah, with, with Tom Hanks. Big, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, my other piece of news is that Creed director Ryan Coogler, uh, although Creed isn't released here until January, has done an impressive enough job to win over Marvel. Apparently, he's um, lo- he's looking as if being being hired on to direct Marvel's Black Panther movie, which will be a new character introduced. Although the character will by that time have already been introduced with a role played by Chaz- Chadwick Boseman in the upcoming Captain America: Civil War. Yeah, he directed uh, Fruitfield Station, which you didn't think as much as I No. Uh, I, I really, really liked Fruitfield Station. It made my, I think, honourable mentions last year. Um, but, it was uh, yeah, it was a film that, for me, felt as if it was trying to make up too much for something, which it just didn't feel right for me, didn't work for me in fully. I mean, it, wasn't, it wasn't a bad film, and it was a good performance as well from um, Michael, uh, B. Jo- Michael B. Jordan. Yes, yes um, who's in that, and then obviously is, is in Creed, playing the main character. So I have, I'm looking forward to seeing Creed, and even though I, I'm not massively into boxing films, and I'm not a big fan of the, of the Rocky series, so if you've seen the trailer, you know it's a spin-off from Rocky, and even uh, Sylvester Sloan reprises his role as Rocky in it. Um, but I'm actually quite looking forward to it, because I think it does look a decent film, and, you know, Buzz has been good around it. Yeah, so it's just annoying again. Like we have to wait that long for it. Mm. Um, you, you look at the Goosebumps film as well. That's not out until February, and it's out on Blu-ray and DVD in America in January. <laughs> so it's just stupid that we have to wait this amount of time for for films. And Creed is a film that might have had a chance to make our list this year mm. of best film from well, it's, the it's indication like, of what we've been getting and now we have to put it on next year's list it's like Whiplash Whiplash was on um, it would have been on last year's but it didn't make it because yeah, of the fact it didn't get released until February when it, was, when it was released in America in November or something like that the year before so it's eligible to be put on lists this year in, in the UK and it might make an appearance on mine or Andrew's list at, at the end of the year you, you just never know yeah but, it is. We. I was looking at a lot of films, um, especially the films that came out in January, and I was surprised that they came out in January. It was that long ago. Things like Birdman, yeah. stuff like that, and it just surprised me that oh, that came out this year. All the unbearable. Be- all the unbearable. What's it called? I forgot the full title now. Damn it. <laughs> the unbearable bearing of being this or something. I can't remember the full thing. <laughs> so yeah, there's a lot of surprises that that came out this year, and it's just annoying with Creed that we don't get to see it until February, and so it'll be part of our list maybe next year, just depending on how we latch onto it. Yep. Um, I've only got small pieces of news because the news has been a bit lacking because it's Quite all weak. to do with Star Wars. <laughs> It's just, oh my god, Star Wars, there's a two-second teaser bit from Star Wars. We've got to see that. And so that's all it's been. If you check over all the I, news, it's... Will you believe it or not, actually? I have a friend who goes to see a fair amount of things at the cinema, has managed to avoid seeing the trailer so far. 
Yeah, and, and so the, the only piece of Star Wars related news that I've written down is the fact that the first trailer for Star Trek Beyond will play before Star Wars The Force Awakens. <laughs> That's maybe not going to win over the best audience because there's a lot of people there. I mean, fair enough, there will be people who love both, but there will be, be a, a fair number of people here who will probably like, boo at that or something. Probably, but how many... I think we're going to be getting. I think we're going to be getting before this. I think we'll get that. We'll get the new Captain America trailer in cinemas, and we're going to get the new Batman vs Superman trailer in cinemas. Yeah, but the, the thing is, when when I hear stories about are oh, a certain trailer is attached to a certain film, when I go to see that certain film at the cinema, I never get to see that trailer. Mm. So it, it's normally America which gets all of this stuff. So it wouldn't surprise me if it's just in america that they get the first trailer for star trek beyond attached to star wars well saying that saying that because i found when i went to see things i've been to see things at a few cinemas and some of them are small uh, are ones that are in sort of other areas and then some of them are ones that are in big city areas and it tends to happen actually the big city area ones have them they get all the trailers the latest trailers and everything like that whereas the other cinemas which are further out of the way don't my cinema doesn't and Cineworld, um, not Cineworld, Empire need to book up their ideas a little bit so, and I also need to introduce an unlimited card because if I tell you how much money I've spent going to the cinema this year, I would have a heart attack <laughs> um, Sony TriStar Pictures have snapped up the rights to the sequel to Trainspotting and plan to have it in cinemas in 2017 despite the film and the script not even being finished yet so the film hasn't even started shooting the script isn't even finished uh, Danny Boyle and the original cast, including Ewan McGregor, will all return. Um, well, they won't all return because I'm pretty sure that one or two of them died in the original film. Yeah, well, all spoiler, the spoiler alert. alert. <laughs> it's an old film anyway, like 96 yeah. somewhere in that region. But the thing is, think how many people now. I mean, it's a film that was an 18 when it came out, and the number of people who may not have seen it yet will then now be kind of reintroduced to it with a new one coming out. Yeah, let, let's just um, see if you'll be avoiding toilets, babies, and sleepovers with other guys who have bad barrels. Uh, yeah, I forgot how. Actually, you do. It's one of those films that you do kind of. The, um, the, the quality of the film does kind of make you forget some of the lesser moments of it, doesn't it? And it also <laughs> makes you think that Danny Boyle was the one who directed this. This was the director who's pretty much torn down a lot of the stuff that he's done and. In subsequent films, yeah. And so uh, I can you remember the last eighteen rated certificate Danny Boyle film? Um, I'm trying to think what the last eighteen rated certificate I was I actually saw at the cinema. So it, it, it's really difficult. Knock knock was mine, mm. but it is really difficult to ch- uh, show how much he's torn down his style. So we'll see what he does with. He can't torn it down for Transbottom Two, considering that it's the sequel to an infamous. Uh, film, which in America they had a subtitle because nobody understood what they were seeing, so he, he can't tone it down. Mm. He has to make it a bit more uh, as insane as that. It needs to be on the level of things like filth. Mm. Anyway, yeah. moving on. Oh, you got more news? Or was that the last one? Sorry. Just a couple of little bits. Couple um, okay. According to the New York Post, director Guy Malik Linton has demanded his name to be removed of the of the latest Keanu Reeves film, Exposed after he was annoyed at how much the film changed during Eden, thanks to Lionsgate, the film now will go under a pseudonym. I just thought I would actually include that in there because it's very rare now that you hear that a director yeah. demands the name to be taken off. That won't be Alan Smithy because that name has been retired, was retired yeah. a while ago, so I don't know what they'll come up with, but I wonder if we're going to start getting them more. But it's more, you don't get that so often now because of the fact of that communication between studios and directors and everything generally with the exception of things like Fantastic Four um, tend to work together a lot better and end up coming together with a final result instead of it being uh, you know this falling out of things after everything and before the film's released yeah and my final piece of news is Seth MacFarlane has confirmed that a Family Guy film is on the way not a Family Guy film as in the Star Wars specials a Family Guy big screen film is on the way and might be out sooner than people think. Uh, hmm. I, I have to admit, I've, I've stopped watching Family Guy. Same here. I haven't it watched it for a while. It's ITV2 in the UK um, very soon. So hmm. 
Yeah, same here. I haven't seen it. Same with South Park. I used to do it on South Park on Family Guy, and I haven't seen a single episode of them in quite a few years. No. Oh, I wonder if that's moving. I wonder if that's moving because of the fact of that they decided to not have it anymore, or if it's because of the fact that they decided not to have BBC Three anymore. Yeah, BBC Three goes digital as of fully digital as of March next year, but it was just ITV they won the rights to it. Hmm. So yeah, after Rick and Morty's finished, which I absolutely adore that animated program, I think I might go back and watch. Family, some Family Guy episodes and some South Park episodes. Hmm. Anyway, back to movies and UK box office top ten. Starting at number ten with Hotel Transylvania two. Yeah, it, it's an Adam Sandler film which will not make my worst list of the year. So he should be happy about that. He does get a mention in my worst ten of the year. This won't be there because it. Would that be the Cobbler by any chance? It might be. <laughs> it, it might also be one film that we're reviewing a little bit later on. Ah. Um, yeah, Hotel Transylvania 2, animated-wise, it's okay, the animation style of it. It looks like a, um, a cartoon from maybe five years ago, but but that's fine. It just lacks in what the first one had, and that was funny humour. There is no decent jokes in this film. It's just rehash of old jokes over again and not done very well. And uh, number nine is Brooklyn. Which I've yet to see. There's two films in this list which I've yet to see, and I so want to see by the end of the year. And I doubt I'll be able to. Brooklyn's one of them. I'm I'm curious to see what you think of Brooklyn because the thing is I've I've heard nothing but really really good reviews for Brooklyn, and I got to say I didn't find it as good. I found it I thought it was a good film. It was a solid performance from everyone. Solid work for directing it, but I thought I thought definitely Saoirse Ronan is absolutely fantastic in the film. Her performance is brilliant. I just didn't think everything else was up to the same level. I didn't think it looked as great. I thought at points it felt very, very much like it was a TV movie. It could have been more cinematic, more of a, a movie for being on the big screen. There's parts where I just thought it didn't feel there. But I, I did enjoy it. I did get into it. But I just found that I didn't, engr- I didn't get engrossed in it as much as I think a lot of people are. I don't get why. I, I, think that, I think maybe a lot of people are getting swept away by it because it is a great performance. But... In the same way that there is, you know, with um, Tom Hardy in uh, the Cray film, um, in Legend, um, with him in that, doing a great performance in an average film, I think this is a great performance in a slightly better performance, better, better level film than Legend, but still the film is lacking. Yeah. And number eight is a new entry for Bollywood movie Tamasha. Yeah, we, we don't get to see Bollywood films at all, so we can't comment on it. I, it's very typical Bollywood fair. It's boy meets girl, boy dances with girl, boy sings really catchy supposed songs with girl. Convoluted story, lasts for three hours, there you go. Yeah, um, the, the, the new entry at number seven is the film Neither of Us Have Been to See Yet, uh, which is Carol. Uh, yeah, this is a movie I definitely want to see. My cinema has been... It decided to show it a week later after every other cinema decided to show it, and the screening times have clashed so badly with where I work that by the time I finish it, they're already halfway through a showing, and by the time they show the next one, it's a bit too late for me to wait around. So I eagerly want to see Carol. This is I'm going to try my hardest to get to see this film before the end of the year. I'm going to try and see this as well. This Hopefully this week, maybe, if I get a chance, if I get a, a free time at one point, I would do next. I've got a few to catch up, including number six is the lady in the van. Yeah, it, it, I love this. Well, I didn't say I, I didn't love this film. I love the acting in the film. Um, dear Maggie Smith, she's a joy to watch, and she plays her character with a plum as well. And um, the Alan Bennett character gets on your nerves a little bit, but you latch on to it and the fact that he's got two sides to him. The the one who writes all the players and then the other side who's let this woman live on his driveway for 15 years and sort of like established a friendship with her and what a lot of people on his street look at sort of like a mother son relationship considering that he sort of like neglects his mother in a way and it's a really funny story it's really well told it's very well acted it's an enjoyable British movie very much like if Last of the Summer Wine went to the big screen now that might give it a bit of a sort of like an old age pensioner feel to it but there is still enough to enjoy in this film no matter how old you are evidently when I went to see it at cinema there was some 12, 13 year olds in the screen of it and they enjoyed it hmm. it's good to hear and uh, number 5 is new entry for Black Mass I reviewed this last week have you seen it? 
Yes, I saw it. I actually saw it. Um, I saw this and the number four film uh, before they were released at preview screening, and I was meant to cover them last week, but so wasn't able to do was it. What your thoughts on Black Mass? I really enjoyed it because um, the director uh, Scott, uh, I forget his name now, uh, directed one of my favourite films of last year, Out of the Furnace, and he is really good at directing drama. And it's a film that I thought was it, it basically is the true life story that that was kind of almost adapted for the film The Departed, um, and it's got it's a film which has got a great performance by Johnny Depp. It's a film that is a solid drama and, and a good thriller. The problem is with Johnny Depp's makeup in the film to disguise him and to make him look like the real Whitey Bulger, um, and these contact lenses. Which I, I'm sure there are times when he's wearing contact lenses. And at other times when he's not, when it's being it's been CG to colour his eyes blue, and I was just so distracted by that that it really took me out of it. Uh, and if I wish it hadn't been like that, because it is a good film and it's a great performance, I did really enjoy it. I did get into it, and it has it has nothing new. It brings nothing new to this whole the, the mobster angle, but it does more than enough to keep you entertained for it, in my opinion. And I thought it was a I thought it was a really good overall film. Just had those detractions from it yeah I, I thought it was a good film um, as I said last week I, I agree with you on Johnny Depp's um, makeup and slight it's very slightly distracting I just feel like it is one of those movies where um, it seems to be all surface it never seems to dig deep enough into the the film itself it always seems to just scratch the surface but never never go to the meaty part of it you're expecting it to explore in a, a, it in a different way yet it never dis- detracts from what it is and so it's not a brave film at all it, it, it thinks that it is but it, it's not a it's very film. by the numbers it is very by the numbers but it does have at its, at its core a great performance by Johnny Depp a great performance by Joel Edgerton and a good performance by Benedict Cumberbatch but he's not really given a lot to do in the film so it, it's not the resurgence that people were seeing it is for Johnny Depp. It, it helps. No. But it's not the fully resurgence for his career. No. The number four movie, Bridge of Spies, um, I really, really enjoyed it. It is more um, sort of low-key of what Steven Spielberg does. It's kind of, in that in that regard, it's similar to um, the, the Terminal, the film that he did, but it is still sticking with the subject he's very much interested in which is to do with sort of history and the cold war events of uh, that happened to do with the the transition between america and the transition the, the exchange between america and um uh, russia of uh, spies and prisoners and it, it's a thing though it, it's it's interesting because the fact that it's a film that manages to be funny but be serious be quite tense at parts um, and managed to kind of tick all those boxes, but never excels at them. It, it's it's one of those films that is not greater than the sum of its parts. It is just kind of the sum of its parts, and that's it. Which is fine because it's Steven Spielberg's sum of the parts, and it's 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 better than it would be, I think, in another director's hands. But it does kind of feel as if there's parts where he kind of went. I could do a lot more of this, but I'm just happy I'll settle for that, and I'll settle for this bit, and I'll settle for that bit, and I was, I just wanted a little bit more, I did love it, I did think it's really good, I do think that it will probably, it's a bit Oscar bait, and it will probably get some Oscar nominations, I think especially for um, Tom Hanks, but also for uh, Mark... I forget Ryan. his name, Mark Rylance, yeah, who I think he will, I think he's definitely up for a chance of winning Best Supporting Actor, because it's a, a film that, it has this, this interest all the way through, and, and it does have that, Spielberg films always have this moment in them now, where you get to a certain point, and it will bring a tear to your eye, and all the way through it, I was kind of, it didn't have that, and I was like, mm, you know, is this going to be the first Spielberg film where he doesn't do that to me? You know what, it got me right near the end genuinely got me right near the end it didn't with me um but i i, I really liked the film i thought the performances from both hanks and rylands was was fantastic and the the script has got the witty corn feel to it because it's the corn brothers who um helped with the writing of the script and you can definitely feel the areas that the corn brothers were were properly involved with yeah I felt like it, it, it's one of those annoying films that, um that while I was watching the film, it was screaming in my head, give me an award, give me an award. It felt like the film itself was made just to win awards. 
It wasn't meant to actually tell a story. It wasn't meant to tell us something different that happened. It was just there for Spielberg to go on, yes, I am this brilliant director, and yes, Tom Hanks is a fantastic actor, alongside uh, Mark Rylance. And I agree with the acting uh, point. It's just I find that really annoying when, when a director pushes it onto you that, oh, I've created the film for awards. And that's what he, he's done. And the, the film itself, like I said, is very good. It sags a little bit in the middle. But it, overall, it's still enjoyable enough. I don't. It's it's not going to make my top ten of the year. It, I might push it into my honourable mentions if I'm feeling generous enough. But it didn't impact me enough to be able to actually leave something with me, and especially the ending. I thought the ending was a bit contrived. Mm. I I didn't have that issue with it. I I just I I just say I it it felt though as if it was kind of hitting below its weight and as if it was almost afraid to try and hit above its weight which is what Spielberg generally does quite well, but for some reason hasn't this occasion. Yeah. Uh, moving on to number three, which is Spectre. Do we have anything more to say on this? Nope. Nope. Uh, the fact that it's boring. <laughs> uh, won't go into that, because we'll be here all night. Number two, The Good Dinosaur. Yeah, um, I reviewed this last week. I'm guessing this is one of the films you've not seen. I've not had a chance, no. Um, considering that it's take, it took you so long to watch Inside Out, um, yes. you'll be watching The Good Dinosaur in March next year, probably. <laughs> But uh, yeah, um, it's one of those films where you definitely don't have to rush out to go and see. Unlike with Inside Out, it is Pixar at its most important, at its best, when it, they are actually telling something relevant. Whereas The Good Dinosaur is, you can see why this movie was languishing around for a good year. It was involved with numerous script rewrites and changes and things like that. And you can tell where the problems lie because this has got none of Pixar's brilliant imagination. Um, that's not to say there, there aren't any elements of the film that are ver uh, very good, because there is. The animation is beautiful. Um, the thing with Pixar's animation, though, is it might date itself a little bit, because Pixar heavily rely on CGI and computer-generated characters, and in about 10 years' time, those computer-generated characters are going to look lacking compared to what we'll get then. So I, I, that's why I always prefer hand-drawn animated films over the CGI counterparts. But the animation in this, there are some breathtaking scenes. There are a couple of scenes which have got that Pixar um, magic to it where it really touches you. And there's an emotional scene which just involves both the characters of Spot and Milo and when they're just drawing circles. As to say, this is my family, this is my family. And the way they actually ex execute that scene is brilliantly well done it is very touching it's just a shame that the rest of the film has to be as generic as it is which means that the number one movie again for another week will be the hunger games mocking jay part two yeah which is an okay fine enough ending to the mocking um, to the hunger games series it has about 20 different endings to it um it suffers from some of the stuff that the mocking jay part one suffered from it feels like a a film that should have been one sort of like two and a half maybe three hour film rather than two sort of like over two hour films because there is just not enough content there to create two films however it is a company that knew that they were going to get a lot of money by splitting it in two and so that, that's how they did it and so it is lacking at times in the film but it's an okay way to end the series Okay, so without further ado, let's get on to this week's new releases with our first film. Uh, Victor Frankenstein. Um, this was a movie that uh, a lot of people were eager to see because when Daniel Radcliffe and um, James McAvoy announced that they were working together on a Frankenstein film, a lot of people actually sat up and thought, two really good actors, two very important British actors involved in a British um, kind of film because uh, Mary Shelley was the one who wrote... Uh, the Frankenstein story and in this case they've got Paul McGuigan to direct who directed Push he's also directed episodes of uh, Sherlock and he directed Lucky Number 11 as well which mm, is not a very good film but he, he, he shows that he can be a competent director at times especially with things like Sherlock and so what he's gone and done with the story of this he's decided to take Daniel Ratcliffe as Igor who works as a circus act in this um, this travelling circus who the ringleader of it is really nasty and James McAvoy who plays the title character of Victor Frankenstein who's a guy who is obsessed with bringing the dead back to life and so he helps Victor Frankenstein helps Igor escape 
from his captivity at this circus and gives him pretty much a name and a life. And he also takes away the hump that people are more used to seeing on um, Ego by e ejecting the horrible yucky fluid from his back. And then he's supposed to walk um, as normal and have more of a life and be part of society. And he's a clip which involves Igor and Victor Frankenstein at a dinner party. Igor and I stand upon the cusp of creating life out of death. Mr. Frankenstein. Victor, Victor, please. I find your promise more than a little unsettling. Igor, speak up. What do you think? Everyday science and technology changes the way we live our lives. Well said, that man. Life and death are different. I dream of a world where hope replaces fear. A world where a murdered man can stand in court to face his murderer, where a crippled soldier, shrapnel in his spine, can be killed, healed, then brought back to life to walk again. Life is beautiful. Now tell me what that says. Death. Thank you very much. I cannot argue with that. There it is, in black and white, but with a little applied science. <laughs> Life. We shall create a life out of death. It's alive. And that perfectly sums up the film. The last little line there, it's alive, because Victor Frankenstein, along with the help of Igor, decides to create life. However, it's not going to be that simple, because on his tail is a police officer played by Andrew Scott out to stop him to show him what, um, to everybody, what Victor Frankenstein is. He's, in fact, a monster. Now, the way the trailer plays out, it plays out like one of the, I think, one of the worst fantasy horror films that ever created, and that is Van Helsing. It has a Van Helsing feel, like they've taken Victoria London and then threw out a lot of CGI paint all over the top of it and said, yeah, here's a high fantasy um, retelling of a beloved story that a lot of people know of and um, for the most part of the film that's exactly what you get you you get uh, a hyper CGI'd over the top silly silly mess of a movie um, a lot of it doesn't make sense and I don't think the film actually cares that a lot of it doesn't make sense for a 12 year it's explicitly violent um, it, it pushes right to the boundaries of 12 year there are some scenes in this movie which I'm surprised they managed to get away with. And uh, and not only that, can I just say the horror horror aspect of it as well was quite strong for a 12. Yeah, because, for example, uh, there is a scene which involves them bringing to life some eyes. And that that's pretty nasty for anybody under the age of 12, especially if you're taking an under the age of 10. They're, they're going to see these eyes move, and it, it's pretty bad on that front. Um, when you do get to see the monster, it looks like a reject from some really bad 1970s stage production of uh, Frankenstein. It, it's so, it looks like they melded a human with a rubber off the top of a pencil. He's got that very fr sort like circular flat head kind of thing and it's really bad created. Acting wise, they both do their best. Daniel Ratcliffe and James McAvoy try their hardest with some cheesy dialogue, some really badly created characters that not even their acting prowess can save them the female role in it is just there because they thought we're gonna have to have a female role in it somewhere the bad guy is about as bad as a slice of bread and it's just the overall tone the overall feel the overall creation of the film is is lacking pretty much on every front and there was hopes for it it could have been an enjoyable film if it if it treated itself like a, a movie where it was just there to have a good time, we might have had a good time. But in fact, we just wanted to get out the cinema as soon as the credits started rolling because we didn't want to see any more. Yeah, I, I have to agree as well. It is a film that just doesn't come together. It's, it's the whole thing of the Frankenstein monster being part of all these bits pieces put together. And that's what this is. It is Frankenstein by name, Frankenstein by nature. Um, it, it It's all put together, it's all held together loosely by threads which don't really hold it together very well. It kind of falls apart. Um, the performances, as you say, are good. I mean, James McAvoy is full on hamming it up. If you've got him, he's full on there. I mean, there isn't a single scene, I don't think, where he doesn't spit 
from his you know ex his exuberance on the screen and his scenes. Yeah, I'm so glad. <laughs> There is a 3D version of this or not. <laughs> I don't know if there is or not, it, actually. Just imagine if you go to see it in 4D, then. <laughs> you come out so soaking, yeah. Um, I mean, Daniel Radcliffe is is almost the same, only a, a lot more restrained, I think. Um, and it's... I feel you, you, it has... As well, you have this character of the the villain, which it, it doesn't need the villain. The, the main character kind of is the villain. And it's a weird thing of them doing that because that feels so unnecessary. It feels like they're just going, oh, we need to, you know, make it a bit more... It needs to fit the confines of a film nowadays and not go the original way of just having no villain. Because that's just is unnecessary. The whole thing of the policeman as well, I felt, was very sort of shoehorned in at times and I I really found that very kind of distracting I wish it had just not been in there at all and I'm really annoyed because I, I like Paul McGuigan I really loved Push I thought Push was a fantastic film and I love what he did with that and and here he's basically gone from doing a an indie project in Push which which had big aspirations and, and set itself big goals to basically do another thing right the other way around which has got a film which has um, looks like a very a very heavy effects budget um, and does has little aspirations as to the, what to do with it which is just a shame yeah um, three quick um, things Daniel Radcliffe reminded me a lot of Dobby the house elf from <laughs> Harry Potter which which he very much like that well he uh, got given clothes so he's free yeah and so there you go he's Dobby the house elf uh, the, the main bad guy was some pompous little git who they've probably snatched from all of it just to throw in there just thought yeah why not let, let's let's just do that let's throw him in in there and um andrew scott who plays uh, the inspector in the film it felt like he was doing his role as moriarty from mm. the sherlock tv series well that's a bit i think he's doing that worse. it's sort of like he was channeling moriarty as much as he possibly could when in fact he got some kind of guy's version of Moriarty that you might actually see in a, a production in your local uh, rec centre or something like that. So it's it's like a jigsaw puzzle where they've got pieces from every single jigsaw puzzle they could think of, but never, ever, ever been able to fix it together. <laughs> okay, let's uh, go on to The Night Before, which is directed by Jonathan Levine. It stars Joseph, Gord Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Seth Rogen and Anthony Mackie as three best friends who basically um, we learn very early on at the start of the film um, you have Joseph Gordon-Levitt's uh, parents are killed in a car crash a couple of days before Christmas um, in 2000 um, cut to present day uh, the two the three of them as a result of that kind of bonded together and they they the two of them helped him through that and it became a thing where every year at Christmas they took him out and they basically got drunk and went out and did all these kind of crazy hijinks and drugs and all that sort of thing uh, cut to present day though obviously it's been a while things have been going on they've been doing this every year but now things have gone on where you have Anthony Mackie's character who is a um, a sports star is sort of becoming quite well known and popular and successful uh, Seth Rogen's character is now married with a baby which is due any time now um, and it's Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character unfortunately though hasn't kind of changed at all he's still stuck in a rut um, and is the one of them which is kind of really looking forward to this whole thing of them going out on this party on this night um, and basically trying to find this mythical party the Nutcracker Ball here's a clip so good seeing you guys hey! Hey, what are you guys doing here? It's the only karaoke place that's open on Christmas. <laughs> yeah, it's our it's our tradition. Yeah. No, I should remember that you guys come here. But Run DMZ, I got to see it. You finally. liked it? It was awesome. <laughs> oh, um, this is what you guys missed. She did Miley Cyrus. She destroyed Wrecking Ball. It was amazing. Thank you. you still like that song? <laughs> Everybody does. You can cry to it. You can run to it. Yeah. You can party to it. Timeless. Uh, what are you guys doing? We're having a really fun night, actually. We're kind of going, uh, not you know, not too hard, but pretty hard. We're kind of just, uh, it's, you know, it's our last night doing the Christmas. End of an era. Last year. Last year. Yeah. Last year. 
what you don't realise is that in that clip, Seth Rogen's character is high on drugs because as they're heading out for the evening, his wife goes to him, "Honey, you've been my rock for this long, this period. Everything's been good for you. Go out tonight, have fun." She gives him a package, and it's got just about every kind of drug imaginable in it. Um, you have this whole thing of that there was this thing, this this party they've been looking for every year. They hear about, which is absolutely amazing, called the Nutcracker, Nutcracker's Ball, um, and actually this time manages to recover three tickets for it. So of course they go and try and find this and it's one of these films where you know it's three characters go on a journey this happens this happens this happens and do they you know they, they all come out of it any better at the end of course it's one of those kind of films and it's it's the christmas thing you know we, we're now into the christmas films we have this we have krampus coming up we had also um released this week christmas with the coopers so i mean why not it's it's a film which is just it's not really funny you have this weird thing as well where michael shannon turns up as their kind of their not their drug dealer but a drug dealer that they have prior dealings with and they keep meeting up with him because somehow they keep managing to lose the drugs that they buy off him um and it's just it's just so weird and mad and and then things later on happen and just literally i was i sat there and i was just like what Uh huh is this is this for real and i just honestly got to a certain point where I just stopped caring, had no interest. And it's a thing of that it's a film that tries to actually have heart. It tries to actually have the whole thing of, you know, growing up and having responsibility and the whole thing of him getting over the past of his parents' death and everything. And it just, it, it, by the time it actually does start to try and put any of that in there, you don't care because it's had the whole thing of um, Seth Rogen's character um, accidentally turning up at midnight mass, completely coked out of his brains, where he meets with his wife. Um, and he, she, he's there with her and her whole family, and he's, he starts freaking out in church, seeing a, a baby talking to him and swearing at him. So, as you can imagine, how that happens, how that works out, and you know, it, it's just, it's a film which just goes beyond that point of anything funny at all. I mean, I laughed at once in it, and it was a physical gag, genuinely, I wasn't expecting, and I was like, oh yeah, that made me laugh. And the rest of the film, no, no pulse at all whatsoever. The, the thing is, though, um, Levine, he worked on 50-50, and 50-50 was a Seth Rogen, Joseph Gordon-Levitt film, which involved um, a really hard subject in the fact that it was cancer, and I got laughs when I called it a cancer comedy. It's just when you read out a box office top ten or something like that, and mention a cancer comedy, things pop into your brain and go, what? They actually made a comedy from cancer, but he managed to succeed on that front, and I was hoping for sort of like kind of similar things when he brought Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Seth Rogen together again in a film and by the sounds of it that's not the case no this is one of those films where you hear this whole thing about if they had fun making it it doesn't come through on the screen if they didn't have fun making it it could be a fun film I think they had lots of fun making this film which saddens me because I like the look of this uh, the film as well I was up for a bit of a, a giggle um, at Christmas, but by the sounds of it, I'd be probably wincing like mad. You would have hated it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm slightly tempted to go and see it just to see if it makes my any of my lists or, I, or whatever. I, I, you going? I, I want you to go and see it and make it, and then see if you tell the one joke that I got. The one joke. Well, not even a joke. The one physical gag that I laughed at. And the only problem is, um, in the next ten days, I'm working nine of them, so. <laughs> I don't know if I can, I can, I can actually find That's okay. It's okay. If you go and see this, it'll put you to sleep. That's fine. I'll go to see it the Star, uh, Star, Trek, Star Wars weekend. Because so, that's when I've got time off. And so, yeah, I'm, um, I'll go to see it. Everybody else can go and see Star Wars. And at least I'll know I'll have the screen all to myself. If that's the case. Because I'll be the only sad person who's going to see something else apart from Star Wars. <laughs> but I'll just go to see it then. And then you, Mark, and um, Saxon from Following the Nerd can uh, review Star Wars instead. Okay. Krampus <laughs> instead then. Um, the second of our Christmas films, because like you said, Christmas season is uh, upon us. And the thing with Krampus is, with um, with the night before, that was a very stereotypical buddy comedy Christmas movie. With Krampus, however, it's doing one of those things which I like. It tells the dark side of Christmas. Not everybody happy, Santa Claus comes to visit them, they visit their family, everybody gets presents, they enjoy themselves. Whereas instead, with Krampus, which is directed by Michael Doherty, it shows um, the evil side of Santa Claus. Santa Claus is shadow. Now, if you go to countries like Germany and Sweden, Austria, countries like that, 
the uh, all throughout December they celebrate uh, Krampus and in different parts it, it means different things it could mean like children walking out on the street with whips they hit you with a whip if you run away they hit you more with a whip <laughs> you have to what? actually stand there take the pain from the whip when you do that you get a present um, what? Uh, I'd just take the whip away from them and hit them with it no you can't do that neither because you will be beaten more so with the whip so, um, to things like, um, if your children has been naughty, you've got to actually give them something bad at Christmas, rather than something good. So, Krampus embodies the evil side of Christmas, and in this, uh, story, we see a family, who's headed up by Adam Scott and Tony Collette, um, they've got, uh, a son who still believes in Christmas, and a daughter who's sort of, like, grown up more so, and they've invited their family along for Christmas. Bit of a bad idea to actually do that because they don't really get along with their family and when the family turns up lo and behold they also bring an auntie who is not a very nice person to say the least and so as you can tell their christmas is a bit of a hell fest the kid the son of the, the um, tony collette and adam scott he decides to rip up a letter that he was going to originally send to father christmas and throw it out of the window and thus summons Krampus, and all evil breaks loose. Here's a clip. We have to keep looking. We have to pair up and take turns. Okay? Yes. Can't go back out there. You see this? It's damn near frostbite in under four minutes. Honey, keep your voice down. Besides of being sub-zero out there, someone's tearing through your fancy-ass neighborhood, Honey. picking everybody Honey. off. It's the truth. Honey, Listen, why don't we just leave, right? We can all pile in the truck, and we'll just see as far as we can get in. And, and, the and truck's and gone. Beth? Torn to pieces. What? Yeah, and even if she wasn't, the streets are totally screwed. We can't go anywhere. It's too dangerous. You got it? Howard, how much ammo do you have? A couple shells still loaded, maybe a dozen in my pocket. Why? I think our best bet is to stay put. Board up all the doors and windows. And as soon as the weather breaks, we'll go find her. I told you we should have gone to my brother's. Sure, Howard, Christmas on a pig farm. Jesus was born in a barn. And uh, I love that little um, bit at the end there, Jesus was born in a barn. <laughs> Where are you actually? <laughs> okay, get that wrong completely. And uh, in that clip there, you heard David Coach knows. He's sort of like, if you want to make a comedy horror film, you really do need to get this guy. Because no matter what, um, what horror you do, especially, like I said, if it's comedy, he hits it out of the park. He was in uh, Cooties earlier on in this year, and I thought he was brilliant in that film. And so he he has got that timing down to a T. Now, Michael Doherty, he created a, a, a Halloween movie, which I now religiously watch every single year in Trick or Treat. Um, there's a sequel, supposedly, of Trick or Treat coming either in 2016 or 2017, and I cannot wait for that. I believe he's uh, directing that as well, isn't he? He is, yes. And so I adore Trick or Treat. Now, the thing with Krampus is... It straddles a really hard line to try and get right. It's one of those films which brings to mind probably one of the best Christmas horror films in Gremlins. Now, if you're trying to be like Gremlins, it's a really difficult thing to do. Melding comedy with horror, that's also a nightmare, nightmare journey which very few directors manage to succeed in. And Michael Doherty did that with Trick or Treat. And I built my hopes up so much so for Krampus that it might have been inevitable that I was in for a fall. Like a lot of people are doing with Star Wars, um, I think a lot of people are going to be in for a fall because they've built that up so much so. And I was hoping to hope six that that wasn't the case with uh, Krampus. Now, I went to see this and by the time I left the cinema, it was 25 to midnight. Because <laughs> um, I went to see the last show of it and so I had to walk home in weather which was horrendous and so it, it gave me time to ruminate in my brain whether I liked Krampus or not and my overall thoughts is I loved it I just absolutely loved Krampus because what um, Doherty he got he got it down to a T he got the feel of Gremlins this is an adult slash children's horror Christmas movie because <laughs> it's, still, it, it's a really weird thing to struggle because if you look at Gremlins you can't see it's an adult film. Mm, but it's not really a kid's film. Elements yeah. to it, but you can't see it's a kid's film neither. Because there are some violent elements into it there where kids would be scared, yet there is elements in it where kids would absolutely love it. Krampus is exactly the same. Um, there is stuff like killer gingerbread men. <laughs> and 
you've got that in kids. Is that, do you think maybe that's some kind of revenge thing from Shrek? It could be, yeah. <laughs> and so kids are going to look at that and think, fantastic, gingerbread men. Yet they used to gingerbread men which like to throw knives and the only way you can kill them is to set them on fire or get a dog to eat them. <laughs> then you've got these brilliantly created characters, this huge mass of nasty worm character and also this bat which has got an angel face on it. And every single monster in this movie is practical. It's proper puppets rather than CGI. You used to touch up CGI's here and there on Krampus, but predominantly it's all practical effects. And that's what I, I loved about the film, the fact that he got the feel of Christmas perfect. He got the feel of a, uh, a family at war perfect. He got the horror element perfect. He got the comedy element of it perfect as well because it's very witty. He gives the comedy to it, just a few of the characters rather than everybody. So it, it's not him shoving it down your throat. You're going to get elements of it. And to the characters which need it as well, which are the, you, the, the strong ones in that comedy element. And so Krampus, I loved it. I was set for a fall and I didn't fall. I, I just absolutely loved it. And Doherty has now created a Christmas horror classic for me. And so every single year, I will be watching Krampus at Christmas, and I'll be watching Trick or Treat at Halloween. And this is definitely in my top ten of the year. A lot of critics have been a bit snidey to do it, and few people have been saying it's a really bad film. I say to them, you just did not get it. You just go in expecting a hell of a lot of fun, some violence, absolutely no blood in it whatsoever. Hmm. There is no gore in the film. I was going to ask you about that. You look at Gremlins as well. There is no gore in that film. There is little bits and bobs here and there. Apart from like, an exploding microwave sort of yeah, gremlin. Yeah, that's not gore. <laughs> well, people might it's argue that. It's not technically classed as gore. So, the, um, yeah, there, there is no gore in this film at all. But it, it's very well imagined from a, a mind that understands what he's creating. I, yeah, go out and see it. And it's done phenomenally well in the U.S., second behind uh, The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2. Nobody expected it to do that well in cinemas, and so yeah, it, it's definitely... Legendary Pictures are going to be really happy with what they've created, because Legendary Pictures are the studio behind it, and they're going to be so happy with what Michael Doherty created. This should definitely push Trick or Treat 2 back to the forefront, and give him give him a budget for that as well. Please go see it. Mm -hmm. I, I actually do want to see it because I was curious before, but I really do want to see it. It's, it's like if I need to see this, I need to see Carol. If I get a chance, I'm going to try and see them now. It's like. <laughs> treat it like Gremlins, not like a standard yeah. horror film. If you treat well, no, that's it like the thing. Gremlins, then that's, you'll that's the thing because you know me, I don't like horror films, but I do like things like Gremlins. I mean, things, ones I was thinking of talking about, like comedy horrors. So it's not so much a comedy horror, but it is still. It's things like um, Tremors. Yeah. Uh, that kind of a thing, which I do love, that kind of cheesy humour sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I might actually enjoy this. I, I'm sort of, like, interested to see what you see, but I'm also wary because I'm afraid that you might not like it, and so I, I'm just going to be saying, screw you, it is in my top ten of the year, I don't care. Is it is it a particularly scare? I mean, does it have loads of scares in it? Like, I, I just no. don't like the horror thing. I hate, I hate jump scares, to be honest. I hate them. It does. It sort of has jump scares, but the way Doherty actually does them, he sort of like jump scares it, but softens it a little bit because mm -hmm. he makes it slightly funny in a way. The way the jump scare happens, it's not one of those signpost jump scares neither, where the, the music heightens up and then you get the jump scare. So you don't know you don't know when it's going to happen, but when it does, it sort of like alleviates the tension because it's sort of like a slightly funny jump scare in a way. Okay, I'm going to have to try and see it. Uh, I'll find out next week if I manage or not. Uh, we're going to take a quick break just now, and then we'll be back with this week's DVD and Blu-ray section in the home releases. So stick around, we'll be back in a moment. There was a, a real sense of you were doing something wrong, but that did give it that, that feeling of excitement. When the reveal of the film happens, that's when it just becomes absurd. And the atmosphere and just the sense you get whenever you go into it is undeniable. It, it did absolutely zero for me, which could be for the hype. What we just discussed there is just scratching the surface on it. Hi, I'm Eric England, the director of Contracted, and you're listening to From Page to Screen, the horror show. 
Right, welcome back to this week's uh, Monday Movie Show. We're into the home release section where we're looking at these big films. Yep, uh, Tom Cruise is back with the Mission Impossible crew in uh, Rogue Nation. We have uh, Joel Edgerton uh, directs his directo- directorial debut and also stars in The Gift. We have um, Guy Ritchie's adaptation of The Man from Uncle. Um, Amy Schumer is in Trainwreck. Uh, Adam Sandler um, is uh, with all of his buddies back again in Pixels, and we have Simon Pegg in Absolutely Anything. So it's a big, big names for all the films in this in, in this release section. Yeah, and on top of that, we have our TV movie of the week and overall movie of the week. But it's the Blu-ray and DVD top ten that we're going to concentrate on for the next couple of minutes. So at number ten is Elf. Yeah, I mean, coming back in, obviously, for the Christmas season, um, must be an offer in lots of places. It is a film that, it, I mean, it's a lot of people say, I've, I've heard oddly enough, a lot of people say that it, for them, Elf is the Christmas movie. Um, I can see that. It's not it for me. I think it's perfectly fine. It's amongst sort of Will Farrell's better movies, but it still has moments where you kind of just want to punch him. Um, but it's, I mean, it's okay. It's uh, it's a film that, to be honest, if you haven't seen it, where have you been for the last 20 years? So, so what is your go-to, say, one couple of Christmas films? Well, my, my Christmas film, watch, I always watch every Christmas day, every Christmas year, um, I watch National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation because it's just, it cracks me up. It's brilliant. You can probably guess what mine is. Uh, Gremlins. Gremlins and Home Alone. Yeah, although there's that, there's that as well. I mean, Home Alone's, a, I mean, as talking about, we had this talk about, you know, our alternative Christmas films. I mean, Die Hard. Die Hard is a Christmas film. But yeah, I, I, it's Gremlins and Home Alone for me. I, I always see Kate Gremlins and Home Alone if they're on a, a TV channel somewhere or just, just watch it because they are the perfect two Christmas movies. Chalk and cheese for me. Um, at number nine is South Park. Which is a film, it's odd to say again, but going back to things we're saying in the in the, the top ten and, and in the cinema section, um, Southport is one of those films that it is a average film, but it is elevated because of the great performance of Jake Gyllenhaal in it. Um, and it's like legend with Tom Hardy. It's a film that it's it's a, a brilliant brilliant performance to watch. But there's parts where the film is weak. It should be better than it should be stronger. And especially from Anton Fuqua, who can direct films better than this. It's a bit of a kind of a almost phoning it in from him. Not bad because it's it's better than the Equalizer, which was awful. But it, it should have been better. Yeah, number eight. We'll just quickly gloss over it because it's a stand-up DVD and Michael McIntyre's Happy and Glorious. And Can't so stand him anyway. So. Mike Double XL. Um, I've not had a chance to see this yet, and I wanted to see it because I was I I liked the first one so much from both from everything I know. This isn't like the first one. It is more of the kind of the MTV movie style thing instead of it being a drama about guys who just happen to be strippers. Yeah, um, see, this was one of the films that made me do a biggest disappointment of the year list as well as alongside um, a biggest surprise list. So it, it, it proves you what I felt about the film. Because if I had actually um, decided to go with a category surrounded this film, then um, it's understandable that it's nowhere near as good as the first one. Because in the first one, it is something like that Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy kind of thing where it is a spy film, but it's not actually about spying. Mm -hmm. Um, If you look at Magic Mike, it's a stripper film, but it doesn't always centralise everything on the stripping. It's all about the group dynamic and the drama between the people who do that. Whereas this one, it's just thrown all that out the window and just says, we are a stripper film. And it just does not get what the first film was about. It set up all those interesting characters from the first film and just threw them out the window made them flat and one-dimensional. From the trailer, it looks like it has more in, in... In, in connection with things like step up films than it does with the first Magic Mike which is a shame yeah because um, you, you wanted to follow alongside Mike's story in the first one whereas in this one they, they tried to add the drama element to it by saying now he works uh, for his own companies he works with furniture and restoring them and he decides to go back into the stripping thing for one last time at a convention you just look at it and go I don't care and number six is Jurassic World we we can't really say much more about this I think it's perfectly fine I don't think it's the best film of the series but it's definitely better than the last one and it was kind of inevitable that it would come along and it's Trevor Trevor um, Colin Trevor 
Colin Trevor, yeah. Sorry, I was trying to get his name right. Um, uh, he's done a good job with it. It's just, I didn't think it was... I mean, put it this way, I've got several of the films that are, have now been released from this year's releases. I don't have this. I probably won't get this until maybe it's a bit cheaper because it's just not one of those films I'm like, oh, want to get it, want to get it. And again, this is another one of those films which is is going to be part of my biggest disappointments of the year. Because it, 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 when you watch the first trailer, it showed signs that mm. something special might have happened, might be happening. And when you watch the film, you go, actually, no, there isn't. I wouldn't say I was disappointed. Because I went in with expectations that it would be okay and not fantastic. And it was okay. It lived up to expectations. It just didn't exceed them. Yeah, it, it is part of that for me. Um, and number um, five, again, we'll just quickly go over it. Mrs. Brown's Boys Live. How now, Mrs. Brown? Who cares about Mrs. Brown? Yeah, Boys another Boys thing I can't stand. Creation. Number four, Ted 2. Which is... It, it's odd. It's... I, I, in, in a way, it's Seth MacFarlane's worst film, and yet it's better than um, A Million Ways to Die in the West. And... The problem is, it's just repetitiveness. It is one of those. It's, it's like the Hangover and Hangover Two. It's it takes the exact same story and the and the plot points. This happens. This happens. This happens. At this point, and it goes long. You just have them. They've they've taken Mila Kunis out of it. They've put in um, the character of um, uh, Amanda Seyfried's character to, as a new love interest thing. They have tried to sort of put in this whole thing of a plot, uh, which gives them a reason to kind of go on a road trip for it. Although to be honest that happens for me far too late into the film for it to actually matter if it had been a film where it's like they go on a road trip and that had been the whole film on a road trip can you imagine going on a road trip with ted that would have been a fantastic film like going on a road trip with paul yeah but it would have been i think it would have been a better film than what ted 2 is it's just i I don't think that ted 2 is a terrible film i just uh, talking about disappointment this is disappointing this is just it it fell so far of what it could have reached and not even if it had been really really trying it just felt like a phone in film yeah it's three for three because ted 2 will also be part of my biggest disappointment of the year. <laughs> your biggest disappointment list is going to be the biggest list of the year isn't it i'm glad to know that the rest of the films in this top 10 are not part of that list so okay there is two other movies even there, like even the number films. one i'm surprised that then and number three is minions um, I mean, it's what more can we say about Minions? It's brilliant. It's funny. It's maybe not. Uh, the thing is, I I think it shouldn't be compared against Spickle Me, because those two films are different to Minions. Minions is a completely different thing. But I thought it was funny. It was giggled all the way through. It. It was it was nicely constructed. It was well animated. It was perfectly fine. It wasn't anything outstanding, but it was because of the fact that they're not really central main characters. They're supporting characters having their own thing. And a lot of the, a lot of it is the you know the infantile jokes in there, but it still carries you through the 90 minutes of the film. Yeah, and it, it's nice that uh, Illuminations Entertainment, uh, the company behind um, the Despicable Me series, is stepping away from Minions for their next film, which is The Secret Life of Pets, which is out um, middle of next year. Oh, they'll probably make an appearance. <laughs> no, they're, they're definitely not, which looks really funny. So it's still got the humour of that. If you watch the teaser trailer, uh, it's just, yeah, it looks really, really funny. So I can't wait for that. Um, and number two is Inside Out fantastic animation film uh, Disney's and uh, Disney picks off a particular a great film but there are parts of it that I thought were it could have done things differently it could have stripped down things but I did love other parts of it really really to a high level um, you know things like the, um, the the abstract reality things and stuff like that kind of thing and the whole concept of the film is really what drives it to be so impressive because and and that's the thing that's what's that's what's important is pixar does this they have a great concept which basically sets it up itself and then just goes and runs with it and that's what they've done again with this and i do wish though there had been a lot more little in jokes in it i think there could have been a lot more stuff in there that would have made it peak more than it does i'm not saying it's bad i'm not saying but i i genuinely after everyone was going oh it's amazing it's, it's brilliant i did love it but I kind of thought everyone was absolutely raving about this. Shouldn't there have been a little bit more to it? 
and at number one is a new win for Ant-Man. Which I really like because of the fact that it feels, for the first time, like Marvel, and I don't mean this as a pun, doing the small thing. Marvel doing the small independent kind of film and story. And it's, it's, it's a heist film. It's not a big save the world thing. But it does come into the story of it a bit later on. But it's more... It is all about the one guy doing this thing, trying to save someone, and that's it. It's not about, you know, a team or a big person, a super, superhero trying to save the world and stop, you know, a big-scale disaster and apocalypse from happening. It's just a guy trying to basically sort his own life out, get his daughter back, and having to help someone else to do that and by doing that he's basically helping someone steal something and that's it and it's it's got some great humor in it as well from uh, Michael Peña who appears in it in, in a supporting role and it it flows and runs along at a great pace and I think it's another great addition to Marvel's roster yeah, sort of um, it, it is a movie that when it, tra- when it does do the Marvel thing it, it just falls down into the Marvel trap holes and becomes like another Marvel superhero film and so when it works it, it works when it, it just seems to be all about character development when it doesn't work is when it tries to be a superhero film that's when it just lost interest in me full stop so it, it's good but it's not great mm, I um, thought it was better than that though <laughs> let's start the DVD reviews yeah. of the week because th- there are big films out this week uh, yep. Mission Impossible Rogue Nation directed by Christopher McQuarrie who's uh, just been announced to that he is returning for the next Mission Impossible film making him the only director in the Mission Impossible series to actually do two films and so we've got um, Ethan Hunt who's played by Tom Cruise and at the start of the film you've got probably the biggest set piece of the entirety of the movie which this clip will explain package is still on that plane Check down the fuel pump. Uh, the mechanicals are locked out. What about the electrical system? Oh, that might work. Uh, no. Hydraulics. Okay, stand by. No, they're encrypted. Benji, the plane. Yes, the package is on the plane. We get it. Can you open the door? I'm by the plane. Benji, can you open the door? Uh, maybe. Open the door when I tell you. And so, yeah, that, that's a huge, massive set piece, which you'll have seen in the, the trailers. Now, after that incident happens, um, Ethan finds himself in a small little record store where he's kidnapped and by a main bad guy. He's tortured, but then sort of like helped out by somebody who could be working for him or could be a double agent or could be working with the bad guys. Somebody, the normal, typical character that you, you find in this movie. And so Ethan decides to contact... Um, uh, William Brandt, who's played by Jeremy Renner, back at MI IMF. However, he discovers that IMF has been disbanded, so now Hunt has to go on the run with the help of uh, Benji, who he accosts in Vienna when uh, at a huge, massive opera outfit where a big another set piece happens there. They go on the run to try and discover who this organization called Syndicate is to stop them. It, it, it's not a very typical kind of Mission Impossible esque. Bond kind of film. There's, as a matter of fact, um, somebody has set up a, a subreddit um, which puts the last Bond film, Spectre, and this one side by side and showed the similarities between them both. And when you see the film, if you sort of like watch them completely separate, you don't realise that. When you read this subreddit though, the similarities are just astounding because both films are very much similar to each other. This one is, is more action oriented than Bond. Uh, Bond is more of a snorefest. This one, at least it actually caught my attention a little bit throughout the film, but it still suffers from the same problem as I had when I went to see it at the cinema, which was the fact that the opening set piece is exhilarating, it's very well implemented, very well constructed, very well put together. It's just a pity that the rest of the film is not that, because what Christopher McQuarrie decides to do is, decides to take a, 
couple of big set pieces uh, one which has happened at, at Vienna at the Opera House another one happens at this hydroelectricity um, plant where um, Ethan has to try and get Benji into there to discover some secrets then you've got a chase and then you've got a big set piece that happens in London so four set pieces and each one of them plods along too much um, there, there's too much set up to them and when the thing happens you're thinking to yourself this is not exci as exciting as it is especially the last half an hour of the movie where it drags its feet so badly that it, it's just boring and that's how Bond felt as well it, 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 the London set piece was the weakest part and in this one the London set piece is the weakest part the group dynamic just never feel like it's there like it did in the previous um, Mission Impossible film and so it, it just lacks a lot of what the um, the previous Mission Impossible film built up and, and it was annoying on that front because I really liked that one Ghost Protocol Rogue Nation I thought it was an average film at best to a degree I agree with that but I do think that it's a film that it's a lot tighter than Bond is agree it's it's a film that it does feel more that they've tried to do the Bond thing for Mission Impossible this time around but they're still it's like they're trying to do the best of both worlds which isn't always the best thing but they're trying to make it kind of like be Tom Cruise being kind of like the Bond character um, but also then injecting the other characters in there as well which at times does feel a bit forced the one thing I would say about it is that the whole thing with the villain if you're comparing it against Spectre the whole thing about the villain is that the more you learn about the villain and the villain, the 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 criminal um, the syndicate thing like that, whereas Inspector, you know that thing, the more you learn about it, the more uninteresting they become in this film. Whereas I'd say it's the other way around. Actually, the more you learn about the villain and the more you learn about the organization in the second one they actually become a little bit more interesting as the film goes on than in this one which is a problem this suffers with that whole thing of the kind of the more you pick threads at it the more it starts to fall apart towards the end so take for that what you will i mean it is a it is a worthwhile film it has a suitable setup suitable story suitable conclusion it's just when you come to the end of it you go a bit meh okay that's that ended that way that happened it, it doesn't really do anything to surprise you it just is kind of a bit by the numbers and ticks all the boxes well in, in this one the syndicate which is uh, the main bad guy played by sean harris which is really annoying in the movie because he, he 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 speaks in a very sort of like very low tone you can't hear what he says most of the time and you, you just tell you want to give him a a mint or something like that um, to get rid of a cold because he just sounds like he's got a cold and so the bad guys in this just don't feel like bad guys and it was exactly the same with Spectre um, Spectre just was boring so badly flat that both of them they suit each other on that front that the, the main evil bad organisation is not bad at all it feels like a kindergarten class could be worse Okay, moving on to The Gift, which is uh, written and directed by Joel Edgerton. Also stars in the film as Gordo. Um, the main characters of the film, uh, Simon and Robin, played by Jason Bateman and Rebecca Hall, are a married couple who move sort of back nearer where Simon grew up. Just move into the house. Things are sort of seem to be going all fine for them and everything coming together. Um, they're looking at trying to you know get settled to have a family and everything um and one day they're out short uh, shortly after moving in uh buying uh, items in the shop when simon is approached is approached by gordo here's a clip hey uh excuse me hi, hi. I, I'm, I'm i'm sorry to bother you um i think i know you yeah i'm sorry i don't i don't can't place you uh is your name simon simon cow yeah hey, simon hi oh uh how do we know you, each other? Oh, I thought, I, uh, I went, we went to school together. Really? Yeah. Huh, which one? Fairmont, Fairmont Park? Park. Really? Yeah. Same grade? Gotta, what year did you graduate? Yeah. Hey, honey. Excuse me, one second. Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. We'll rush. This is my wife, Robin. This is, I didn't oh. get your name, sorry. Uh, Gordon Mosley. Gordon. Hi. Oh. Gordon. Robin. Gordo? Hey. Wow, buddy. I did not recognize you. Gordon oh. Mosley. Oh my gosh, honey, yeah. uh, Gordo and I went to school together like, I don't know, what, really? 80 years ago. Oh <laughs> Almost. 
So short, shortly thereafter, they sort of end up sort of becoming friendly with him, although uh, Simon is sort of making a point of keeping a distance from him, that Gordo was a bit of a weird kid, um, although Gordo then starts coming around to the house, sort of leaving them a gift on the doorstep as the, thing, um, as the title would go, so, and don't really want to go into it any further than that but um because it would be sort of going into potential spoiler territory it's a film that has these things that you'll have you'll go into it and from the way it's set up and the way it's done you'll have preconceptions and the thing is it's clever about how it plays with them and how it messes around with them for both the characters and for you the audience it's a very very cleverly crafted thriller it has some shocking kind of really almost disturbing moments in it as well but it is very very sort of cleverly written very very cleverly concocted and also has some great performances from uh, Jason Bateman in particular and Joel Edgerton Um, Rebecca Hall has some good moments in it but I think she's kind of falls to the wayside a bit I don't know necessarily that she's given enough to do um, but certainly for the moments when it's required she does step up to the the plate Um, and I I think that it is a brilliant film brilliantly nicely done it is a definitely film you'll come away from it with possibly some disturbed feelings as a result of it but it's a it's a very very cleverly done and well put together thriller yeah it, it, it had... i don't i don't want to say any more than that saying any more than that would give away things and i really don't want to do that for anyone who hasn't seen it see it fresh it, it is a really creepy film it is one of those films where it feels like something is crawling on your arm you know when you get that like feeling not the goosebumps kind of feeling but you you feel slightly on edge because you don't know what to expect from any of the characters in the movie and um, what could actually just maybe the slightest little thing might push the buttons of one of the characters might make them explode yet they'll reel themselves back to be normal again and so it is a movie where you're always on edge at times and that's what a thriller should be like uh, that, that's the whole purpose of a thriller a thriller mm-hmm. is supposed to make you engaged in the movie but also make you feel slightly tense and this movie gets that right I, I think Joel Edgerton um, is a very interesting writer and a very interesting director if this is what he can create as well he's a really good actor but if this is what he can create he's got a very very interesting career ahead of him when he decides to hang up um, the acting uh, career and decides to concentrate on directing if he goes down this kind of uh, route then I will be looking forward to what whatever he does in the future and so it shows you how well, how, um, well of a director he is, how well of a writer he is um, it's just everybody involved I think they handle their characters really well and like you I don't want to give stuff away because there is stuff in this film where it's annoying if you get told about it or even if you get hints dropped at you about it and you need to discover it for yourself and so I, I really liked the gift it surprised me it surprised me a lot I wasn't expecting much from it and I like films that do that yeah I mean surprising. thinking back it's a film that it, in a result at the end of it is very similar kind of the feeling of it to Nightcrawler where you'll come out of it and you'll that was a really really good film but I need a shower yeah it, it, it makes you slightly uneasy but Again, this was one of the films that was um, was top of my list when I was creating my um, biggest um, surprises of the year. So the, it, I always had this movie in mind after I saw this one that um, I needed to create a character of um, a category of biggest surprise of the year because there are films like this that deserve that mention that did surprise me and. It, it, I love movies that come out completely left field. You know nothing about it. You go out in the cinema to see it and you just come out of it and go, I wouldn't mind going back in to see that again. Okay, next film. Unlike The Man from Uncle, and, <laughs> unfortunately. Mm. Uh, direct- <laughs> well, yeah, for me, yeah. unfortunately. But directed by um, Guy Ritchie, uh, who brought um, Sherlock Holmes to the big screen um, in mixed. Uh, fashion uh, the first one really good the second one t- I don't know what he was doing but yeah it didn't have any of the ingenuity and smartness of, of the original and in this one what he's decided to do is get two actors which again when you see their name on a film you think to yourself oh what am I in for in the form of Henry Cavill who plays um, Solo and Arnie Hammer who plays Ilya, uh, Ilya Kuryak and 
and it, this is based on the 1960s 70s british tv spy series and it's set in the 60s in the cold war um it centers around uh, the cia agent of napoleon solo who i said there is played by henry cavill he's um he successfully helps out a character who's played by alicia vikander who plays gabby teller a uh, defect to uh, west germany um uh, despite the fact that he's always got on his trail uh, Ilya Kuryakin. However, unfortunately for Solo, he has to team up with Kuryakin to try and stop this um, evil organisation uh, from getting Gabi's father, who was a scientist, and secrets that he holds. Um, and they do book heads with each other a lot during the film. Here's a clip. Soviet architect travelling to Rome would never dress his woman in the clothes you tried to put her in. You try to dress her like someone on your side thinks someone dressed behind the Iron Curtain. She's from behind the Iron Curtain. That doesn't mean she wants to bring it with her. We need two purses, please. And every day in clutch. And grab that belt. I... No. No, not at yours. The Raban. You can't put a Paco Raban belt on a Batu. She's not going to wear a Batu. What's wrong with a Batu? Nothing. If you're fat, the Dior goes with the Raban. It won't match. It doesn't have to match. Have you seen the price of this handbag? It costs more than my car. You can get back on your horse now, cowboy. I'll see you in Rome. And so, like I said, they always book heads through the film to try and stop this evil organization. Now, the thing with The Man from Uncle is it is obsessed with style. This is completely littered with style and absolutely no substance whatsoever. Um, the costumes look beautiful, the sets look gorgeous, so the way they're, where they've actually gone is, is very 60s. Um, the cars, the way that... They, that clip there was just a full-on conversation about Alicia Vikander's character wearing a dress or wearing an outfit. And they constantly relate to that throughout the film. Um, a character, if they've got something uh, misleading regarding their, their outfit that they're wearing, they, they note that all the time. And I think Guy Ritchie was doing the clothes show of the movie rather than The Man From U.N.C.L.E. He wasn't interested in the spy elements of it. He wasn't interested in any of the set pieces. He wasn't interested in something that pushes an action movie along, and that's action. He was more interested in what the character was going to wear next. And it bored the hell out of me. Uh, both Henry Cavill, who is a pretentious prick, to be honest, in this film, um, it actually mirrored his life proper. If he's like this in real life, then I definitely don't want anything to do with this guy. Uh, Arnie Hammer, who plays Ilya Kurak, and a uh, very stereotypical Russian accent there. Um, so it's, it's just everything about the movie is stereotypical, down to a T. And whatever Guy Ritchie did with Sherlock Holmes... He's just gone and thrown it at the window with uh, the man from Uncle and just went, pretty dresses, pretty clothes. That'll do. That'll catch people's eyes. It's like a magpie being shown a shiny thing. Ooh, shiny, shiny. In this case, ooh, dressy, dressy. No, it, it, I didn't like it at all. I, I was bored throughout. I When I first saw it, I didn't have the best reaction to it. I did have issues with a lot of it. I do agree it's very, very highly stylized. Um, there is a massive amount of substance, but the thing is that when I afterwards I really did want to go and see it again, and I saw it again, and I really enjoyed just kind of the ride of it, because um, I I found myself really getting into the humour of it, the wit of it. I found there were some really genuinely witty moments that just cracked me up. I mean, there's a torture sequence in it, which then afterwards turns into another a, a kind of reverse torture sequence, which then ends up being very humorous but very dark humoured. Um, which I I just found myself at that point almost cracking, almost losing it completely just from laughing at it. Um, and it's got that very weird kind of 60s sense of humour about it, which I think is where it, it kind of it, it's very very mixed up, mixed match of sort of very modern styling but very classy sensibilities and sense of humor which is where i think yourself and i think a lot of other people have issues with it have problems with it yeah i just didn't like it at all i, I wasn't i it's just like he said he he had wit humor in um, in the sherlock holmes film not so much in the second mm. one because i think he went too much over the top with, with 
that kind of stuff. And he tries to bring that with the warring characters in this one, but I don't think Henry Cavill and Army Hammer were the, the correct actors to play it. Uh, Solo and Ilya Kuryak oh, at yeah. all. I, I just don't think that they've got the characters down to a T. Because I uh, can, I agree with that. I do agree they're a bit miscast. I think Henry Cavill definitely is miscast in it, uh, probably off the back of Superman. But he doesn't have the suaveness to him that Napoleon Solo needs to have for the role. But I still think that. I mean, it's the kind of thing that if I showed this to my father. Uh, as much as he know the original anyway, and uh, but I think he would get this a lot more than sort of people who are you know our sort of age. Yeah, well, um, if my mum was alive, she was a big fan of the Robert Mitchum, uh, David Niven, uh, 60s and 70s TV program, and she would look at this and go, "Oh God, this is bad." <laughs> Cause, uh, it just doesn't have the heart and feel of that. There was wit in that TV program. But it also understood what kind of thing it was, what what program it was. This one is just thinks it's witty, but it more centers around clothes. Mm. Okay. Well, we could be here all night anyway, so yeah. Uh, going on to Trainwreck, which is uh, written by Amy Schumer, directed by Judd Apatow. Um, Amy Schumer starring in the film as Amy um, a girl who at the very start of the film we're shown as a little girl she's um, she experiences her parents breaking up her father tells that her and her sister that monogamy is not the way to go cut two years later and um, she is a, a girl who goes through a continual slur of one night stands um, her sister is sort of uh, married and has a stepson and is sort of dealing with trying to work all that out um, she though is not having none of that not interested she has a sort of a kind of steady boyfriend who doesn't know about her being sort of with other people on the side um, and she is doing all this sort of thing while she then actually meets a character who she potentially could be interested in um, when she's doing an interview for um, she's going through to interview this person for a magazine here's a clip oh my god He's calling. Why would he call? You guys just had sex. It's probably a mistake. It's, yeah. it's a mistake. He's, he's butt dialing you. Hello? Oh, hey there. It's, it's Aaron. Oh, uh, this is Amy. I think you butt dialed me. No, no, I, I, I dialed you with my fingers. What'd she say? What'd she say? Shh. He called me on purpose. Hang up. He's obviously like sick or something. So he's, um, yeah, what's up? I was calling to say I had a really good time last night. I was wondering if you wanted to um, hang out again. Will you say that again, please? I was wondering if I could see you again. You know what? I'm going to call the police. Hold on, hold on. Uh, yeah, I'll just talk to you about it tomorrow at the interview. Okay? Oh, yes. Yes, she's in okay. it. She's in it. Bye. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll talk to you then. Oh, man. Huh? Uh, so here's the thing with Trainwreck. It is. It shows all the symptoms and hallmarks of the problems with Judd Apatow films now not Judd Apatow films as they used to have a problem where it used to be just gross out went far too far and didn't know when to stop this actually kind of with the humour as much as because it's probably not written it's, this is not written by him it's probably because of the fact it's been written by Amy Schumer has that kind of level of it does gross out but it stops at a certain point and goes although there are a couple of scenes where there are things like there's a scene where she asks a guy to talk dirty to her in bed and it's just genuinely one of the most uncomfortable and just scenes that goes on for far too long it's a film which is basically the, the, that's the whole symptom of it it's genuinely uncomfortable for far too many parts of it and then goes on for far too long and it, i mean it's like the whole thing of this is 40 which went on far too long you know 40 minutes too long this doesn't quite go on that long but it still goes on far too much um the the thing is it's got this main character who is a train wreck and is not likable and the way it treats people and treats men in particular doesn't win you over to her and the only reason that she's actually likable at all is because all of the other people around her are so absolutely disgustingly horrible that you just want to go around slapping them and hitting them and I mean, you have this whole thing that she's got a boss. Surprisingly, it's Tilda Swinton in the film, who I did not recognise for the life of me. I was honestly watching it, I was like, that's Tilda Swinton? I did not see that as her. 
uh, plays her boss, and her boss is absolutely horrendously horrible. That you just kind of want to grab hold of a shaker and say, you know, you're a human being. There's something in there at least. You know, there's got to be a, a spark of decency in there amongst you. Not. And she worked at this tabloid rag news sort of magazine thing, which has all these things and the topics they come up with is just degrading. And all the way through it, I, I honestly. I was found it such a detestable experience. I really did not care about the character. As the film went on, cared even less. I cared about the whole thing of potentially having a relationship and whether or not she can do that because of the fact of her state and her past and the way she's been affected. And I, I honestly, at the end of it, just could not care. Horrible. Hated it. Really, really, really despised it. It's the typical Judd Apatow thing, isn't it? Where he takes a despicable, deplorable character and tries to make you feel sorry for them or tries to make you feel some kind of emotion for them in the first, I would say, 35, 45 minutes of the film, then decides to introduce the drama element of it and already you're sitting on an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes, before he then thinks about sort of like bringing some kind of conclusion to her life in a positive, happy way. And after that, we're past the two hour mark. And I, Judd Apatow really does need to stop doing comedies past two hours. I, I saw on Twitter a, a little bit earlier on um, somebody sending a tweet When did comedies become longer than two hours? Because mm. comedies used to be able to pack a punch, pack all the gags, and be funny within about 80 minutes, 75, 80 minutes. You look at things like Liar Liar or, or A.S. Ventura, The Mask, and early Jim Carrey stuff, early Adam Sandler stuff. Those kind of films there, they're 80 minute comedies where they tell a story, a very thin story, but had the had, um, had the jokes to it. Introduce Judd Apatow into the world, and he thinks he can mix drama with comedy, stretch it past two hours, make it relatable, and go, oh, there you go. When in fact, you just want to punch him because he's just keep on rehashing the same boring, annoying characters over and over again. Whereas the first time we felt nothing for them, so what makes you, us think that we're all going to feel for them again like the 10th film. We're not going to. Just it, stop it. There was literally a point where it got to a certain point and then a thing happens between characters, between Amy Schumer's character and Bill Hader's character. Uh, not This is after they've other things as well. And it gets to a point there and I, I literally looked at the, the counter and it was like 90 minutes. I was like, right, okay, finish it there. That would have been perfect. Cause then it would have left off with, you know, well, it sets up, you know, well, this might happen afterwards. We don't need to see what happens afterwards. We just need to see that this is where they're left at. This is a suitable conclusion. Don't dribble on for another half an hour. It did, though. Unfortunately. Yes. Pixels then, Chris Columbus, a guy, a director who we know and love. He's done some fantastic films in the past. That can't be said about Pixels though, it, because it has the actor which we all absolutely love, Ian Adam Sandler, who plays Brenner and Kevin James, who plays the president or Cooper. Um, these are they're all the characters um, in the film. Josh Gad, who plays Ludo, and at the start of the film, we introduced them in younger form. They are nerds. They are friends, but they're obsessed with video games. Um, and Adam Sandler's younger character of Brenner goes up against Peter Dinklage, Dinklage's younger character of Eddie in a tournament where Eddie cheats, and so, so obviously he loses Brenner. Fast forward, um, and then they're, they're all adults. They're all have their own normal lives. Um, Brenner, he he's got a relationship going on, and like I said, Cooper, he's the president. Bad things happen when video game characters decide to think, yep, it's time to take over the world, so they need the help of a convict played by Peter Dinklage to try and save the world. Here's a clip. In exchange for helping us, I will personally speak to the parole board about reducing your sentence. Pass. Pass? That deal don't work for Eddie Plant. You want to fire blast this help? He has some demands. Demands. The bifocal blaster is here, by the way. I want an island. Mm. You're not getting an island. Then I want a full pardon. I want to get out of here for good. And after I do, I don't want to pay no taxes, like, forever. And I want a stealth attack helicopter, like they fly over the Super Bowl, at my disposal at all times, you know, so I can fly around. If the world's still here, I don't want to deal with traffic no more. And lastly, I want you to set up a romantic rendezvous between me, Serena Williams, and Martha Stewart in the Lincoln bedroom. Just 
just listening to that clip there, I was reminded how much funnier that scene was in Armageddon. Yeah, and the unfortunate thing is, that's the funniest scene in the film. The, the bit inside the prison, that is probably the funniest bit in the film. It shows you how misstepped this movie is. The, when, when Pixels was first announced and Adam Sander was announced... Uh, um, attached to it there was groans but when we started seeing concept footage and stuff coming out of the film we were looking at it and thinking actually this might be pretty decent you've got Josh Gad who successfully hit it big with Olaf from Frozen, and even though he, he did previous work on that and so he's got a madcap kind of character to him and Peter Dinklage as well and yeah I know Kevin James is involved but you've always got a blip on a film and you think <laughs> This could be entertaining. Oh, it wasn't. Um, the, the Pac-Man is introduced in it. Who's evil? They get the the creator of Pac-Man, and he gets annoyed by Pac-Man after being attacked by him. You, so you've got a scene where they reenact a full game of Pac-Man involving minis and him chasing them down in the city. You've got Centipede involved and Donkey Kong and Space Invaders and all that kind of stuff and. The most interesting thing about the film is the pixelated, even though they're not pixels, they're called voxels of the. And, but the film wouldn't have made sense if it was called voxels uh, of the characters that created because they are really well done. That saves the film. If it wasn't for them, then the film itself would just be another one of um, Adam Sandler's big, massive ego fest, which is unfortunately led by Chris Columbus. Because, like I said, Chris Columbus is a director who knows how to handle a kid's film, who knows how to handle an entertaining film. This isn't kids related because there are some really questionable scenes in the movie and questionable jokes. But he knows how to handle that kind of thing, and so I don't know what he was doing here. I think he was just stroking the ego of Adam Sandler again. So overall, the film itself is stupidly disappointing, but it's not going to make my disappointing list of the year because it doesn't deserve that. But it's not going to make my worst list up here because it is saved by a few bits and bobs. It's it's a film that for me, I'm just going to say quickly, it is a film that arrived 20 years too late, as well as having humour that's about 20 years too late and out of date. It's just it's it's far too classic that it wants to be. I mean, if it, if this had been done 20 years ago, it would have been actually passable because a lot of the jokes would have been you know workable or acceptable and it, it, now it's just a lot of stuff in there that you just kind of go don't need that anymore that doesn't work anymore go back to you know writing it again and, and come up with something that's a bit more relevant yeah you, you look at the characters that they've used in this film and apart from pac-man and maybe donkey kong how many the uh, the audience that this is aimed at is very early teens how many know who cuba is mm. how many know um, have played centipede or the original Space Invaders or things like that. Very few of them have actually played that and so the film is aimed at that humour wise when in fact the film itself should have been aimed at people over the age of 30 to be able to get references in the movie when you don't want to watch it if you're over the age of 30 because you're just smacking your head against something hard because it's just this is what we get. This is what represents what our childhood was like. Thank you very much, Adam Sandler, you idiot. And Chris Columbus. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, um, Adam Sandler's new uh, Netflix movie, the was it the, the Incredible Six or something like that, was happening that's um, is coming to Netflix uh, in three days or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, moving on to the last film, Absolutely Anything, which is directed by Terry Jones. Um, it is a film that stars Simon Pegg as a, a man who... Well, as bat crap crazy as this sounds, um, you have a whole thing where there are aliens that are members of this intergalactic thing. They are sort of um, looking at the, the human race and they're deciding, well, the human race is kind of up next. What do we do? Do we accept them into this or, or do we completely destroy and annihilate them? Um, well, what we'll do is we'll put them through a test that we normally do. We'll pick one of them at random um, and give them the ability to do absolutely anything with the, the magic power which we'll bestow upon them. And, of course, going through the list of random people, Simon Pegg's character is the one that's picked, finds um, after having a sort of a, an accident on his bike, the, he uh, then wakes up with the ability to be able to say absolutely anything and shake, as long as he shakes his hand when he says it, in a kind of like a gesture of this happens, then it will happen. Here's a clip. Right, what's next? 
Oh, this one's in German. Oh. Wow. Let me be able to understand German. Meine Weltanschauung war in Schadenfreude getränkt, als ich mit meinem Doppel... What are you talking about, Dennis? De shut up, okay, I can handle this. Dennis, she is madly in love with me. Okay, what is wrong with that? She's not going to want to marry me or have my children. Dennis, what are you talking about? Actually, that is a really good point. What are you talking about? Dennis, be able to speak. Biscuits. What? Biscuits. Maybe if I make her love me like a little bit, you know, not so much that she wants to marry me. For crying but... out loud, they're in the cupboard. What are? Biscuits. Well, I'm not going to give you a biscuit until you answer my question. Biscuits. Red biscuits. Black biscuits. Is that all you think about? Biscuits. Please, please, please. Nothing else matters. Biscuits, please. All right. All right. Dennis, become a rational thinking creature. Look, I just can't concentrate on anything till I've had one of those biscuits. I know it's crazy, but that's how it is. I guess I'm kind of hooked on them. So please, give me just one biscuit, then I'll be able to think about something else. Hmm? That makes sense. So you have this whole thing of the... What you have here is he, he is this um, kind of interest in the girl who lives in the block of flats with him that's uh, Kate, played by Kate Beckinsale. Um, she has this um, ex-boyfriend who is kind of still interested in her and a bit over the top is stalking her and everything and all that kind of gets thrown into the mix. But the thing is, the problem is with this film, um, it, it's a film which is a fantastic, simple complex a complex um, concept which could work if it was done in the right way and it's just not there are, there are touches of moments in it when it, it really does do things well like the whole thing of it has to be specific in the way he says something and clever in the way he does it I mean, there's a whole scene where he's in front of the mirror and he's saying you know make me into um, the great a great man and he turns into Albert, Al Albert Einstein, you know, he's, he's like, don't, I don't mean a great man like that, I mean a great specimen of a man, you know, and has to be specific of, you know, what he wants to do with his power. Um, and it, it cuts back and forth between this happening on Earth and these aliens and this ship that are watching and experiencing things that are happening. And, and that, that whole thing as well with the aliens really does not work. It's very... I mean, it's obviously Terry Jones, but it's very Python-esque that it doesn't work. The rest of the film doesn't entirely feel kind of like a Python thing. And and that, that is the problem with it. it. It's kind of all over the place with how it's been executed. It doesn't really have a set way that it wants to do things. It just, it's doing all these gags without having any kind of set way of doing them. Um, and it's a shame as well, because when you heard there in that clip, Robin Williams doing the voice of Dennis, the dog. Um, and this is be obviously a his last performance that he recorded some time ago before they finished filming and it's it's a shame this has to be his last film because it's not a bad film but it's just it, it has got some laughs in it it will make you laugh at a few points some of the ideas as i say are brilliantly done but just not executed well and it's just a shame that it kind of falls flat a lot of the time because of that and things that happen in it could have been absolutely brilliant is it not they're just anything it's not absolutely anything it's just anything yeah, I, I haven't seen it, and I just don't like the look of it, to be honest. So, it's not bad. I mean, I mean, saying things like um, against things like Trainwreck and and against um, uh, Pixels, it's better than the two of them. Only just marginally better, but it's still better. Yeah, pass, <laughs> pass. To be honest, I I have no intention to see it. I don't think I I, I need to see it now by the end of the year because it's not going to trouble any lists or whatever. So. It's one of those movies where I just lay it by the wayside. Um, that's it uh, for reviews for on this week's show. TV movie of the week. I only have one. Same here. For Saturday, the 12th. No. No, mine's Saturday the 12th. BBC Two, not Film Four. Shock. Yeah. 10.45pm, uh, uh, and it's The Prestige. Christopher Nolan's movie with um, Hugh Jackman and Christian Bale about magic and um, magicians and it's I, I think a really good film I, I've, I've really been going back over Christopher Nolan's films recently and, and I'm finding that going back against them they're, they're just as great watching them it's like Insomnia Memento this uh, The Prestige um, great great films um, I'm curious to see what he will do next yeah and uh, mine is I am actually going with film for so yeah slight cheat <laughs> I could have went with um, the the uh, the subtitle version of Princess Mononoke I could have gone with that kind of thing I didn't do that 
Um, I am going for a stupid of hour clock kind of film, but it's on film for on Friday the 11th at 1.25 a.m. in the morning or Thursday night, so late Thursday night. Um, it's directed by Dexter Fletcher. It's Wild Bill. Um, it's a good film. Yeah, I re it's on a stupid airway. So if you've got any kind of recording facility whatsoever, then definitely do record it. Or um, I'm not sure if it will be on like a phone demand kind of thing. If you've got like a really nice swanky TV like I've got, and you've got UView built into it, then you can watch it fine on that uh, front there. But I highly recommend Wild Bill. It's a brilliant British um, drama with hints of comedy, but it is quite touching at times. Um, it's quite brutal at times as well, and so. Yeah, I, I highly recommend that. It's not a week where I actually have to see it. Choose one out of your list. Because I was looking over the films that are on TV over the next week, and it's a bit, it's a bit lacking. Mm. There wasn't very. There wasn't many a lot. Yeah. Out. I mean, it's things like um, on one of the nights. I think it's Wednesday night. There's Birdman of Alcatraz, which is a classic on film four. Um, that's a great film, but I went with the Prestige. And I, I, I was tempted to go with on Channel 5 on Sunday afternoon is Aladdin. So that, that's a classic Disney film, so I was tempted to go with that. But I thought I would go with Wild Bill. But that's it for this week's show. What is your overall movie of the week? Because um, I wasn't here last week, can I say Bridge of Spies? You want? <laughs> I mean, it is. I mean, I would. Um, I wasn't especially enamoured with Victor Frankenstein or the night before. Um, I haven't seen Krampus, but I suspect if that had been the case, and it's as good as you say, maybe Krampus would have been filmed. But go see Bridge of Spies if you haven't, um, or see The Gift on DVD, because The Gift is a really good film. And it's Krampus for me. Definitely Krampus for me. I, I absolutely adore that movie, but I agree with The Gift as well. The Gift will actually surprise you. But that's it for this week's show. Make sure you check out the website, mondaymovieshow.co.uk, for... Um, when when the next show will happen and what's going to be on that next show you can also check out the UK box office top 10 which is the only place you can check it out now following the nerd no longer wants my top 10 hmm. which makes me a very sad person but I can slightly sort of understand as long as they don't drop the show then we're fine because <laughs> the, the, the way they look at it is the top 10 gets done on the show they don't need it on the site as well so it's slightly understandable but I do want to punch Mark in his face <laughs> You better hope he didn't listen to that. He, I'll see exactly the same when he's on the Star Wars special in a couple of weeks' time. Also, make sure you check out Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Monday Movie Show, Twitter at Monday Movie Show, I'm at Cryptic Tadpole, Andrew's at EHDVD. Um, email us, Monday Movie Show at yahoo.com. I don't check that, it's probably full of spam, to be honest. <laughs> Comments are better on Facebook or Twitter or on Spreaker.com, where you can find our page there on YouTube on iTunes, on Android, on any kind of device that has any kind of listening capabilities. You'll probably find us peeking our heads up from from there somewhere. Following the nerd.com, even though they don't deserve a mention, thanks for dropping my top ten again, not bitter much. And also got from page two screen.com. He's rend uh, Stuart's rending up his end of year stuff and we are ending out this week's show with a clip from a film that we might be looking at on next week's show. Slightly lackluster stuff next week because the week after that you do have the giant behemoth that is Star Wars however out on Saturday I know very weird dear you've got comedy film which has got an 18 rated certificate in the UK Ooh. surprisingly of sisters so until next week goodbye bye bye oh man who called the cops I'm at a pretty big party huh Oh, is 500 people too much? Popo! Popo! Oh, somebody call a stripper? You gonna take your clothes off for us? You can't come in here I got without this. the judge signing the thing. This is where I live. This is our house. Yep. This is where we live, okay? And this is our property for the next 24 hours. A lot of sex is gonna happen. A lot of sexy times. You can't stop that. Last time I checked, sex wasn't against the law. As much as you would love that, wouldn't you? Mark, Won't you, you step can't. off, Lou? Don't you know I'm no cop? Now we know that. Officer Donuts, why don't you go back into your squad car and go save a kitten from a tree? Because these pussies are doing fine. So wrap your mind around that, Captain Crunch. Capiche?